Stefan Hostinski, thank you for coming to Eden today. Um, I'd like to start by asking you about your keynote speech this morning. Could you perhaps elaborate on your theme? Yeah, so my keynote was about one-to-one -one online, online learning, and I mm. described it as a maybe partly forgotten uh, part of uh, e-learning, mm -hmm. at least from a research point of view. Uh, but I also wanted to point out, so having a tutor and the students working one-to-one, -one, often you see that as something completely different from network learning. Yes. But then I also underlined that a network is actually many one-to-one uh, -one mm -hmm. relationships, mm -hmm. and, and that perspective can help us understand also how we learn mm -hmm. in networks, mm -hmm. uh, I, I would say. Uh, network learning is, is rather a nebulous term because people use it for different ways of describing different types of learning, don't they? Um, for, for you, what is network learning? What, what are the characteristics of it? That's a, that's a, good, uh, it's a, it's a good question. There's this uh, standard uh, definition. There's a network learning conference. I know they use mm -hmm. this standard definition where you had uh, IT as a, as a way of connecting people mm -hmm. that work on, mm -hmm. on joint tasks, for example. Uh, but I, I went to a workshop recently where we talked about net, networking offline, so networking mm -hmm. about digital technology. Mm -hmm. so, so for me, it's hard to pinpoint exactly what network is mm -hmm. beyond you know, that we actually are communicating with each other, sharing resources. Uh, those kinds of things. I suppose it means different things to different people depending on the context. But yeah. I, I liked the way you, you tied in um, the theory of connectivism with, with this as a possible explanatory framework. Do you think connectivism actually explains it the best? Is that the best theory to use? I think there are d different theories and I think they, they are complementing each other. So when I do research or in our group, we use different theories at different mm. points in time. So mm. I think connectivism is certainly one of those. I think in, in the context of one-to-one -one mm. online tutor tutoring, I think Vygotsky's zone of yeah. proximal development yeah. is a yeah. good one. And from a Swedish perspective, I think many here are, are, are very influenced by social cultural uh, theories of, uh, of so, learning. So Engström. Engström or Selya, Mark Selya, Martin yeah. and uh, uh, I was kind of I was working with Roger Selya uh, recently. Actually, we we shared a, um, a week together in Singapore, and he was talking to me about his his theories around this. Um, and I, I, I think they're rather they can be rather complex theories. The cultural historical activity um, theory approaches. Um, how do we make that more accessible to people? How, how do we explain this to to the layman? Yeah. It's, I, I once I tried I wrote a paper a couple of years ago where that I labeled uh, online learning as online participation and right. the idea of that paper was to just lay out that it's it's more or less all about participation and, and learning is connected to what you do the things you have around you and what you yeah. do with them who you who you talk to and in that sense I think if you understand social cultural or connectivism as, as yeah. being active and you know motivated and engaged in right. your learning that's not that complex but when mm. you get into these concepts uh, you mm. talk about uh, yeah zone of proximal development yeah. that yeah. might be confusing but but mm. the main idea that you can learn more uh, with someone that can challenge you mm. that's a very easy idea so it, maybe it's about how we talk about these things so, so everything you've said so far to me um, strikes me that it's very socially orientated. It, it's very much about the social richness of learning. Um, is there any circumstance where you think that pe people could learn solely on their own in a kind of almost like a Piagetian kind of a sense mm -hmm. as a solo explorer? Yeah, I, f I think so. I think we have the, the evidence. If you take MOOCs, for example, mm -hmm. we're learning that if you have a, a master's degree or something, you're much mm -hmm. more likely to be able to complete a course more or less by your own. So I think, and the old distance education uh, mm -hmm. uh, has shown that it is possible, but it's, yeah, f far from, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a model for a few, for a few selected ones. Mm. I think that, um I mean, we're, we're talking about um, social context and, and solo context, but learning is learning ultimately, isn't it? I think mm. it's about the tools that we use. You mentioned mm. MOOCs. Mm. Now, um, there is an opinion going around the, the professional circuit that, that MOOCs have lost their first 
impetus. You know, the, the reason why they were first invented or, or design, devised was so that people could learn collaboratively and, and in a very free and open manner. Mm. Do you see MOOCs as having deviated from that significantly or are they still what they were before? Yeah, they certainly deviated from that idea. If you look at these uh, big platforms, edX and, and, and FutureLearn, mm -hmm. it's very much about one to many. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm from a university that, uh, that are currently producing mm -hmm. lots of MOOCs. And there is this idea that maybe it's possible to, to do it in more mm -hmm. networked ways. So for example, I talked about in my keynote about this mm -hmm. talk math project, and there yeah. we have this idea to make it as a module. So you mm. might be able to introduce it in an edX MOOCs and, right. and then it might help. So it's not only about the platforms, it's also mm. the universities that do the courses. It's like they're, it's like when you first, you, you start being a lecturer at the university, you yeah. start, you give lectures because you think that's what you're supposed to do. And the first time yeah. you do MOOCs, it's sort of, I've, you've seen other MOOCs and you think that's how they're supposed to be, but maybe mm. hopefully we'll learn Mm. Uh, yeah, we, we, we learn along the way. Mm. You, you mentioned Talk Maths, which, which was one of your major projects. How did that start off? What were the origins of it? It's, we had uh, another project to, <laughs> to confuse everyone, but a, another project called Math Coach, which is very organized, in a, in a, has, has its certain structure. So it's uh, tutors, teacher students who work as tutors to mm. support K-12 students. And we wanted to have another project where we could experiment more. Mm -hmm. So we want to experiment with math discussions online in, in, in more open ways. So then we applied for funding from a sort of non from an agency that supports mm -hmm. uh, doing services and products. So it's not a traditional research project in, in, okay. in that sense. But it's got some very good practical um, uh, outcomes. Yes. Yeah. Um, for example. <laughs> Uh, so we just that project we just started in in uh, January, but we wanted to bring out mm. the idea that if you if you as a teacher, as a parent, as a friend want to help others in mathematics, you should be able to do that online and to connect. So it's it's this idea that anyone can can meet to discuss mathematics. We were talking about. Um uh, the idea of one-to-one -one learning earlier on, and um, you mentioned uh, Wenger and, and some of uh, his, his work. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I, I like the way when Wenger talks about social learning, he does it in a very broad way. And mm. there's one example that I really like, uh, which I think is it's, uh, it's uh, someone in a hotel room in an evening preparing for a talk the next day. And he describes this as social learning, because when you prepare you see the audience in front of you, you know some of the people who will be there. So in a way it's an right. indirect interaction you're having. So yeah. it's, a, it's a social act by yourself. It's, it's a kind of like self-mediated um, version of social learning where, where you are imagining the audience. Uh, I mean, that, that's, that's fascinating. I, I'd, mm. I'd, uh, I'd not considered that before. Mm. Thank you for that. Mm. <laughs> um, I'd like to turn to, to the idea of e-learning in, in more uh, focused detail. Uh, could you tell me, what do you consider to be the main characteristics of a good e-tutor, somebody who tutors in e-learning? What would they be good, doing? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think what we emphasize, so we actually have formal training for our yeah. uh, tutors that they go through. And one of these, so I can give you some examples. Mm. Well, one is to build on what the student already knows. So start mm. by asking, yeah. what have you do, been doing before? How have you addressed uh, the problem? And the other mm. one that I talked a lot about during the talk today is, is this idea about working with questions. So trying to avoid yeah. giving answers mm. uh, before, before the, the, the students ask you or giving simple answers. You mentioned the, the question, what are you thinking right now? I mean, that, that's a powerful question, isn't it, really? Yeah. It is, it is. And uh, yeah, so when we look at, we have this database with all mm. questions and we can see that that was, was one of the top 10 questions. So it's mm. asked. It's asked a lot. It's mm. asked both in the beginning of a conversation to get the students to start talking, mm. but also in the middle of problem solving when you say, what are you thinking or how are you thinking? Mm. And it's, it's a very good way to, to, to get the students. You can see that they pause for 30 seconds or a mm. minute and mm. then they, 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 they come with something. This is what I'm thinking about this problem. What would it take for a traditional classroom teacher to become 
a teacher in e-learning, effective teacher in e-learning? What, what would be the distance of, or the, the differential, the, the gap that they, they need to bridge to become a really good teacher in e-learning? That's a good, that, that it's, it's a good question. You know, in one sense, maybe we, we say that you need to completely rethink, you know, you should stop lecturing, you should be, mm -hmm. you, you should uh, only ask questions and, and, and be open for problem-based learning and so on. But I usually start from this idea that a teacher, if you do something very simple, so to take the first step is something yeah, yeah. very similar. So in, in Sweden, for example, all schools have this, digital whiteboards that no one uses, so maybe a, a, a simple tip of so something yeah. that I yeah. can use on this board just to see, or the mm. learning management mm. system, you know, something that, that I can start with. I, mm. I think yeah. that could be a great, great source. And, and also getting teachers to share their experiences. I think mm. I, they mm. tend to l listen much more on each other than, than by someone like you or me coming mm. and telling them yeah, yeah. Uh, what to mm. do. I suppose it's a case of moving beyond what you would normally use technology for to, to looking at what it could be used for in the future, maybe, or in, in extending and in enhancing people's learning. Is that what you see? Yes. Yeah, something sim I think maybe starting with something that is simple but very mm. powerful. And, and that can be something like, for some, mm. that can be uploading material before mm. you meet your students so that mm. are right. prepared and to discuss them. For some teachers, right. Our university, what they call flipped classroom, but yes. it's basically about preparing for, for your meeting. For yeah. many, it has made them to rethink what their role as a teacher could, uh, yeah. could be. I suppose it moves beyond the substitution level to, towards the augmentation level that Pentadur talks about in the SAMA model. Yeah. yeah. Right. One final question I'd like to give you, which is rather a, a meta question, really. It's quite a, an all-embracing question, and it's simply this. What do you think um, about digital education are there aspects of education that digital will replace completely i think the most obvious one is probably delivering delivering content right uh, uh, we talked about during the other keynotes today simplifying administration for example mm. digital assessment mm. there's there's great potential there and i think maybe the only thing we're sure of or i'm not sure we're sure if we're sure about that that as well, but it's the role of universities maybe to assess and to validate yeah, knowledge yeah. And, and, and so on. And to give the accreditation perhaps that, yes, that, that, yeah, that yeah. is required. I mean, the, the, on the horizon is, is um, a lot of advances in artificial intelligence. Do you see that as playing a role in the future of education? Yeah, I, before I was quite skeptical, but I touched upon that in yeah, my did. talk uh, uh, as well. And I think that's fascinating. And yeah. we try to mix those uh, uh, competences in, in our group. And I think, yeah. you know, artificial intelligence in the hands of, their, of the yeah. teacher. So uh, we have this idea about uh, tutoring software suggesting questions yeah. to you. But I don't believe in automating it fully. It's sort yeah. of, yeah. It's, it, can it be a tool for a teacher? Uh, for, yeah. yeah. Stefan, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much.